And before Dr. Marjus starts, I would just like to introduce him really quick. So um, today we'll hear from Konstantinos Margitis. He's an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the Mount Sinai Health System, the chief of neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Morningside as well. He is a uniquely qualified neurosurgeon with dual postgraduate fellowships in complex spine surgery from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and in pediatric neurosurgery from Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. Dr. Margistis obtained his medical degree at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki Medical School in Greece. And at the University of Athens, also in Greece, he earned his PhD for research related to the effects of intrathecal baclofen therapy on the central nervous system and completed his neurosurgery re residency. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Surgeons of England. He also holds a master's certificate in healthcare leadership from Cornell University. And Dr. Margitis has been published in a variety of scholarly journals, including the Journal of Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, Neuromodulation, and the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology. Dr. Margitis practices general neuro neurosurgery and complex spine surgery at the Mount Sinai Hospital and Mount Sinai Morningside in Manhattan, New York. And without further ado, I will turn it over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it, it is a great pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Um, my topic might be a little bit more technical, uh, but I think it is important to give you, you know, our perspective, the, the medical perspective uh, on traumatic brain injury, things uh, that uh, we consider important and, uh, you know, how we manage these cases. Uh, don't expect to fully understand all these things. I mean, your surgery residency is seven years, but I believe that uh, you'll be able to get uh, the, the, the main principles of what is important uh, when we manage the traumatic brain injury in the acute setting right after you know, it has happened. Um, so uh, can you see my screen? Okay, very good. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, so I will start uh, first with uh, the epidemiology of traumatic brain injury. It is a big public health problem. Only in the United States, there are more than 2 million uh, emergency department visits every year for traumatic brain injury. There are over 300,000 hospitalizations and unfortunately, approximately 50,000 people die from traumatic brain injury every year. And uh, it is estimated that up to 5 million people live with um, a disability that was caused by traumatic brain injury. And uh, all over the world, there are around 70 million people that they suffer uh, traumatic brain injury every, every year. Uh, the causes for, uh, uh, for the United States, mostly it is false, but uh, we also have motor vehicle accidents. Uh, unfortunately, we have a 10% uh, of violence related uh, trauma. And then there are some uh, hit, hit by objects. And then we also have like a significant amount of uh, injuries that uh, the mechanism is unknown. Usually these patients are found uh, on, on the street and it's not clear what caused the accident. So you can, you can tell that, you know, this is some important, again, public health uh, problem. Uh, so we'll start with the classification of traumatic brain injury and why, why there is a need for classification. Uh, the need is that traumatic brain injury is actually a heterogeneous group of pathologies. Uh, for example, you can see here the, the, the CT scan, the computer tomography scan of six different patients that they had a similar type of injury and they have a clinical exam, but they have a totally different pathology on the CAT scan. These pathologies I will see later they are totally different in their management and also to totally different in their prognosis. So we need a system to classify the traumatic brain injury. And in order to classify, uh, we need uh, to do a very small introduction on the anatomy of, um, of, our, of our skulls. So this is a cross section of, um, of, of the head. You can see here's the bone. Here's a thick membrane that we call the dura that protects the brain. And uh, right after the dura, there is a thinner membrane that we call the arachnoid. And under the arachnoid are all the blood vessels of the brain. So if there's a hematoma that will develop between the bone and the dura, we call it epidural hematoma. If it is uh, between the dura and uh, this arachnoid membrane, we call it subdural hematoma. If it is under the arachnoid, we call it uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, if uh, the bleeding is inside the brain, then we call that contusion. And uh, then we have the diffuse axonal injury. So remember, the, the neurons are nerve cells that have some very long projections. And uh, the bodies of the nerve cells are usually here in the gray matter. And uh, then most of the axons are here in the white matter. So if there is a significant acceleration to the brain, what can happen is that sear forces can develop 
because there is different specific gravity of the gray and white matter and basically the axons can get um, torn in, in that interface over here. And that's a diffuse axial injury. And then we also have uh, the swelling of the brain after an injury, and this is the cerebral edema. So we see we have at least six different types of, um, of brain injury. Um, and uh, another way to classify the, the brain injury, the traumatic brain injury is based on the severity. Uh, as we'll see later, uh, we assess the severity by calculating the Glasgow coma scale. This is a degree of uh, the level of uh, consciousness of the patient. So depending on how impaired the level of consciousness is, we um, classify the brain injury to, into mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, also, we can classify the injury based on whether it was closed or whether it was penetrating, for example, gunshot or stabbing wounds to the head, uh, or based on the type of acceleration forces that develop. Uh, so if there is a linear acceleration, for example, for example somebody hits uh, um, the, the head against the wall, then we have a linear acceleration. Then most of the time we have a fracture or a bidural hematoma. There's if there is some, some kind of rotational component to the acceleration, then most commonly we see contusions, subdural hematomas, or <clears throat> diffuse axonal injury. And uh, we also have uh, radiographic classifications uh, that they are a little bit more you know, complicated, a little bit more technical. Uh, and I just want to bring that uh, here as, uh, um, just to be, to be a more comprehensive, but we don't need to analyze these radiographic classifications. So let's uh, discuss about the pathophysiology. Pathophysiology means that what is the abnormal physiology that happens after a brain injury. So we have the primary injury that happens at the moment of, of, uh, of the accident. And that has to do with uh, mechanical deformation, mechanical type of uh, injury to, to the brain. There is no way to treat that unless you prevent uh, the accident or the traumatic event in the first place. And uh, if, uh, but, but that's not the only injury that will happen to the brain. Unfortunately, we have the secondary injury. So, uh, the, the primary injury is not the only injury that will happen to the brain, but there will be additional injury because the brain might herniate, and we'll see what that means, might uh, get uh, swollen, and that's the edema. Uh, there might be impaired perfusion of blood to the brain, and there might not be enough bl blood going to the brain, and that's the ischemia. Uh, there might be expansion of the bleeding, and, and that's the continued hemorrhage, or the patient might develop seizures, and that can cause additional injury. And there are some other uh, also mechanisms for secondary injury. Um, that are a little bit more, um, um, yeah, I don't think we need to analyze them today. Now, uh, I mentioned the herniation. So the, the meaning of herniation is um, protrusion of tissue through an opening. So inside our skulls, uh, the dura that we mentioned before, which is a thick membrane, creates some compartments. Uh, so there is a fold of the dura here, that we call it the folks that separates the, the, the right from the left hemisphere. There's another fold of the dura here, which we call it the tendorium, which separates the infratendorial and the supratendorial compartment. So if there is a mass lesion, let's say a hematoma over here, they will start pushing the brain and the brain will find the path of, of least resistance, which will be through the openings of the dura. It will start herniating. And you see here a type of herniation that is one of the most dangerous ones. We would call it tendorial herniation. So basically this part of the brain starts protrude over here and starts compressing this part of the brain that is the brainstem, the brainstem controls the breathing, con controls the heart, and uh, controls all the vital function of the body. So um, the hematoma here can basically cause injury to the brainstem through this herniation mechanism. And that's something we need to prevent because if a brainstem uh, gets injured, then uh, most of the times this is uh, an injury that the patient cannot survive. Now let's go over some types of uh, hematomas. We mentioned before, the epidural hematoma. So this is a, a cross section of, uh, of, of the head. So basically it was the head as though it was cut like that in this view. Uh, and you're looking, let's say from, from the front, um, uh, the, the skull. Uh, this is the bone and uh, the orange membrane is the dura. And you can see that the hematoma here is between the dura and the skull is basically lifting off the dura from, from the skull. This uh, type of uh, hematoma is usually uh, associated with a fracture. And here you can see a computer tomography scan of the brain. This is an axial view. So uh, imagine as though the, the head was cut like that and you're looking uh, from the feet up. So this is the front of the, of the head, the back of the head. This is the right side, this is uh, the left side. So you can see here, uh, the, the brain is the gray area. The white area is the bone that surrounds the brain. 
And this uh, uh, light gray area is basically the hematoma that is uh, developing and is compressing the brain. And here's a different uh, view of the CAT scan um, in uh, different windows, we call it. And you can see this line here where this is there where the fracture was. And that because the, the bone broke over there, it injured a small uh, artery and that artery start bleeding. And this is why this hematoma formed there. So these hematomas can be associated with uh, the so-called lucid interval. So uh, what happens is that uh, the patient has the accident initially is unconscious because uh, the whole brain was shaken. So the patient had basically a confusion on top of the hematoma. And then as the hematoma, uh, and then the patient wakes up and you know might be able to talk and uh, it might give you the false impression that everything is fine because he was the patient was unconscious and now he's conscious talking, walking around. But what happens is that as this bleeding continues to evolve and to expand, then uh, it will start compressing the brain and then uh, the patient will go into coma again and does the lucid interval that is, uh, you know, it's, it's notorious and because uh, it can lead to uh, a misdiagnosing. You might think that the patient only had the contusion when the patient has this very, very dangerous pathology. And uh, most of the times we operate on these hematomas. Uh, there are some specific criteria based on the thickness, uh, based on how much uh, it uh, causes uh, a deviation of the midline of the brain and based on the volume of the hematoma. Uh, another type of uh, hematoma is the subdural hematoma, where you can see here that uh, here's the dura and uh, here's the brain surface and the hematoma is between the dura and the brain. And uh, this uh, hematoma is uh, usually associated with uh, injury to the underlying brain. And most of the times the patient is unconscious, even when the emergency medical services bring the patient to the hospital, the, hospital, uh, the patient is unconscious and uh, it carries um, a higher mortality than the previous hematoma. There are some criteria that we use um, uh, about when to operate. Again, it has to do with uh, the thickness of the hematoma and the midline sieve. <clears throat> so in order to understand the midline sieve, this is a, again a coronal view of the brain. And uh, here's the hematoma. And uh, these are the ventricles. So there are some small cavities that contain fluid inside their brain. And these cavities, uh, normally they're exactly in the middle. So they're normally exactly over there. But you see, because of the hematoma is pushing the brain, these ventricles have deviated towards uh, uh, the opposite side. And uh, there's significant midline shift, and this is a hematoma that needs to be operated. And uh, then we have uh, contusions, where basically contusions are small uh, areas of bleeding inside uh, the brain. And uh, what is important uh, with these contusions is that they can uh, expand over time, and uh, we call that blossoming. I don't know why they chose this word, you know, for such a you know dangerous pathology, but um, um, yeah, they, they can. They, there is a risk of exp, uh, of expansion for these uh, contusions. And here you can see another computer tomography of uh, of a brain of a patient who had uh, multiple contusions. You can see here this light gray area represents uh, areas of contusions, and these uh, areas here they also represent uh, areas of um, of contusion. And uh, then we also have uh, gunshot wounds to the head. Uh, these are very sad cases most of the times, very young people, and uh, they're very, most of the times they're devastating injuries that the patient cannot survive. And uh, you can see here uh, a coronal view where this is there where the bullet entered uh, the skull and these are some fragments of the bullet and uh, the bullet <clears throat> ended up on the opposite uh, side of the head. Again, this, uh, this uh, bone window where it shows the fragments of the bullet and the bullet on the opposite side of the head. Uh, so uh, there are some important points uh, for the emergency medical services uh, when they're transferring these patients from the site of the accident to the hospital. So it is important to maintain uh, oxygen, good oxygenation. It is important to ventilate the patients because, uh, uh, because of the injury to the brain, they might not be able to breathe on their own. So in this case, we might have to ventilate them, give them um, air through what we call an ambu bag or a ventilator, or we might have to intubate them to ensure that there is air going into their lungs and there is oxygen that's circulating in, the, in their blood. Uh, we also need to uh, protect the spine because it's very common in these patients to also have a spine injury. So if we don't take uh, measures to protect their spine from abnormal movements, then we might cause additional injury to their spines. If there is a fracture, the fracture might move out of the normal position and cause additional injury. 
uh, they need uh, to maintain this, the blood pressure. And uh, there are some, uh, some um, therapeutic measures that they can administer to achieve the above goals, like uh, give sedation paralysis. And uh, a few words about uh, the mobilization. So you can see here uh, how they have placed uh, the patient on a long plastic board and they have these straps around the, the, you know, the, the body of the patient. So the purpose of that is to maintain the, the spine straight and to, to minimize any movements of the spine because this patient might have a fraction of the spine. And uh, if we don't immobilize the spine, then during the transfer from this, uh, the scene of the accident onto the stretcher and from the stretcher to the hostel bed, then there might be additional injury that will happen um, in, in the spine. And uh, also, if we need to move the patient, there is always at least three people that they move the patient and we try to uh, move the patient in a, uh, without any rotation, without any flexion uh, of the spine. This is the so-called log roll type of rotation where you see there are three people that they're holding uh, the patient's body and they're rotating uh, the whole body in, in one piece without any rotation between, for example, the pelvis and the chest, without any rotation, rotation between the chest and uh, the head. So uh, the emergency medical services, they also have some uh, rules. And uh, if the patient meets a specific criteria, basically if there is a significant trauma that has happened to the patient, then they need to transfer this patient to a trauma center. Uh, so what are these trauma centers? Why do we need to have uh, hospitals designated as trauma centers? Uh, trauma centers, they are basically ready to treat any kind of trauma that will come through the door. They have special capabilities, so they have uh, additional resources in the emergency department to allow for a rapid evaluation of the patient in the emergency department. They have a blood bank and a significant amount of blood available if the patient is bleeding to be able to, to transfuse blood. They have uh, a surgeon that is physically present in the hospital 24-7. Uh, they have advanced radiological capabilities to get computed uh, tomography scans right away. And they have neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, and other surgical specialties uh, readily available to provide uh, uh, surgical services to, to the injured patient. Uh, they also have intensive care unit. They also have advanced rehabilitation care. And they're also involved in the, the prevention of trauma in the local community. They're also involved in trauma research. And there is a, a very rigorous um, and continuous performance evaluation program. So everything that is done in a trauma center is being evaluated both internally, but also by the American College of Surgeons to make sure that uh, it meets specific uh, quality criteria that everything is done correctly and uh, that uh, the outcomes of the patients are what they're supposed to be and that there's no quality, that there's nothing that is done in a poorly way. So once the patient arrives into the hospital, uh, what we do is the uh, ABCs. So basically we need to treat uh, the pathologies that will threaten the patient's life uh, uh, um, more um, uh, more quickly. So if, uh, for example, the airway, basically the, the trachea or the mouth is injured and the patient cannot breathe, then uh, we can only stay without air for just a very few minutes. So that needs to be addressed first. Then if there is a significant injury into the lungs and uh, the air can go through the airway, but it can go into the blood because there's some kind of pathology in, in the lungs, then this needs to be addressed next. Uh, if there is a problem with the circulation, for example, uh, the patient is bleeding and uh, the patient has lost a lot of blood, then we need to transfuse blood and we need to control the bleeding because that's what will kill the patient next. And uh, then we assess the neurological status and uh, we assess whether there is any uh, injury to the brain. And then we check uh, the patient's whole body to see if there's any uh, additional injuries uh, and uh, to, to treat these injuries. So about the neurological exam, I will just very briefly mention that there is a, a reflex that we have. So once light goes through our, our eye, there is a, a signal that goes into the brainstem and then there is an order that uh, comes, uh, that initiates in the brainstem and uh, it orders the pupil to constrict. So if there is uh, some kind of intracranial injury, then uh, there might be some kind of interruption in this uh, reflex pathway and that can present with uh, a dilated pupil on one side. So you can see this patient, this pupil is smaller than this one. The right one is smaller than the left one. So this is highly suggestive that uh, this patient has an intracranial pathology and uh, there is something compressing that, these nerves. And uh, that's why this uh, pupil has started to blow. 
have started to, to dilate. And then in some extreme cases, we can see this uh, so-called blown pupil where you know, the, the whole pupil has, has dilated and uh, we cannot see the iris of, 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 the, of the eye. And this is uh, a sign of significant intracranial pathology. And um, the, this, this, is, this um, examination of these people is part of the neurological exam that we do in these patients. Then the next thing that we do is to assess the level of consciousness. And uh, we use the Glasgow Coma Scale. So basically we assess whether the patient is able to open uh, th their eyes spontaneously or whether they can open their eyes uh, following command or whether we need to apply an obvious stimulus, some kind of painful stimulus to see if the patient is able to open their eyes. And um, um, if uh, there is no opening of the eyes at all, that's the lowest score that uh, it, it's, it's not good for the prognosis of the patient. Then we also assess the verbal response, whether the patient is oriented and uh, can tell us that, uh, can tell us uh, the, uh, their names, uh, where they are, what is the date. Uh, then uh, if they are not oriented, then they might be able to talk, but they might be pent, and this is what we call localizing. If the patient cannot do that, but can only flex the arm, this is what we call flexing. And uh, in some cases, the patient cannot do any of this and can only extend the arms. And uh, that's, uh, again, a sign that there is progressive injury because for a patient to have, to, to be able to follow commands or localize, the patient needs to have an intact cortex. If the cortex is injured, then uh, and the injury reaches that point, then is able to flex. But if the injury is even further down up to that point, then the patient can only extend. Or if uh, even the brainstem is, is uh, injured, then there will be no motor response. And that, again, is not good for the prognosis. So the next thing is uh, to do, uh, most of the time we have to do an operation with these patients. There are several types of operations that we, we can do. The three main categories is craniotomy, where basically we open the skull, we remove the hematoma, and then we put back uh, uh, the skull, the, the, the bone. So you can see here there was the, the bone was cut here and there, and you can see there uh, the bone was secured with some tiny screws. They are not visible, but basically the whole idea is that we replace the bone back. In some other cases, uh, we place a catheter to measure the pressure because uh, we expect uh, the brain to swell and we need to know exactly what is the pressure inside the brain to be able to treat that. And uh, that is done by opening a small hole in the skull and uh, introducing a, a small catheter. And uh, in some cases where we expect significant uh, edema of the brain, then uh, we open the skull, we remove the hematoma, but we do not replace the bone. That gives space for the brain to swell out and uh, that keeps the pressures inside the brain relatively low because the brain can swell out. Otherwise, if the bone was there, this edema will have caused a significant increase in the pressure of the brain and that will have caused additional injury to the brain. Uh, in regards to the timing of the surgery, when we're dealing with uh, epidural hematomas, the goal is to, uh, I mean, we know that if we operate um, uh, more than two hours later, then the outcomes are really uh, getting worse. Uh, for subdural hematomas, you can see here this graph that if we operate um, uh, four hours or more later, the mortality uh, really increases. So uh, basically what we want to do is when we are dealing with a patient that has a surgical lesion, uh, meaning that the patient suffered an injury and has a, an injury that requires surgery, we try to do the surgery as soon as possible because every minute counts in these cases. And, uh, the faster we decompress the brain, the more brain will preserve and uh, the less permanent injury happens to, to the brain. And uh, after the initial uh, injury uh, and uh, surgery, there are some specific uh, param physiologic parameters that we're aiming for in the patient. We need to maintain that uh, the blood oxygenation is uh, adequate. We need to maintain uh, a good uh, arterial pressure we need to make sure that the patient is not, uh, uh, does not have a high or a very low temperature, that the blood glucose is within certain limits. And uh, this is a little bit more technical, but you know, there is a whole range of physiological parameters that we need to maintain in order to increase the chances for a meaningful recovery uh, on, on the patient. So an overview is that when we're dealing with a traumatic brain injury patient, it is important to maintain the blood pressure, the oxygenation, to mobilize the spine, to decompress the brain and uh, control any intracranial bleeding, uh, to prevent and uh, if uh, it presents treat uh, any secondary injury. And then it is important also to make sure that the patient will have uh, early rehabilitation care. 
And uh, just uh, you know, one, um, one break in this chain is enough to cause uh, irreversible injury. So something as little as a few minutes of uh, hypotension or a few minutes of decrease the blood oxygenation uh, are enough to cause irreversible and devastating injury to the brain. So there is uh, a need for attention to detail. And that's why these patients are usually uh, treated and monitored in intensive care unit uh, where there is a constant monitoring of, of the patient. And um, there, there's a whole team of nurses and doctors readily available to treat any, any new abnormality that might, um, might develop, any new signs of secondary injury that might present to the patient. So about uh, the prognosis, uh, the prognosis, uh, the most important factors are actually non-modifiable. We cannot really change them, and uh, they are the patient age. We know that uh, younger patients have more physiologic reserves to uh, recover from a traumatic brain injury versus uh, older patients. Uh, also has to do with uh, the initial Glasgow coma scale because that's, uh, again, a sign of the severity of the injury to the brain. So patients who present with a deep coma will not do as well as a patient who present with a, a mild confusion. And also the pupillary exam is a very important prognostic uh, factor because as we, as we saw, it is uh, a proxy, it is an indirect uh, uh, sign of uh, the degree of uh, compression of the um, intracranial nerves and also the brainstem of the brain. And there are also some modifiable factors that uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can change them, we can make sure that, that they don't become abnormal. And this is again uh, the, the blood pressure, so we need to avoid any um, time periods of hypotension, any time periods of uh, hypoxia. Uh, we need to also be careful not to hyperventilate. So hyperventilation means that we um, give too much air to, to the patient and uh, that decreases the levels of the CO2 uh, in, uh, in the patient's uh, blood. And that's not good because it causes uh, constriction of the blood vessels. And we also need to prevent uh, any herniation of the brain. Usually the, the way we can achieve that is through surgery by evacuating uh, the, the, the hematomas. So uh, traumatic brain injury is one of, of the fields, in, in, in one of the fields in medicine that uh, we have seen a significant uh, advance over the last uh, decades. So in the, the 30s and 40s, 80% of the patients you know, will die from this type of injuries, while now this percentage has fallen to 20% and even less than that. And there are seven reasons for that. We have advanced imaging, we have the computer tomography, and it can show us exactly where the injury is in the brain and we can uh, target our therapy and uh, treat that uh, lesion. We have uh, the trauma centers and we have uh, coordinated care for these patients and a very close um, integration of the trauma team, the neurosurgery team, the orthopedic surgery team, the ED, and that is done through the, uh, uh, through the trauma centers. Uh, we have some guidelines that we, we follow. We have uh, better emergency department and emergency medical services uh, nowadays compared with uh, years ago. We have better ICU and better rehabilitation nowadays. So all these factors have led to the significant improvement in the outcomes of uh, the patients who suffer a traumatic brain injury. Uh, a few words about uh, what happened during the COVID. Uh, you know, New York City was hit with COVID in a very, it was a very difficult time for us. And uh, the good thing that was we noticed uh, a decrease in the number of uh, traumatic brain injury uh, patients, probably because, uh, you know, the, the, the patients, I mean, the people, you know, decreased uh, uh, the activities outside their homes. And uh, uh, another thing that was characteristic during this period is that we, we had to use personal protective equipment, all the staff, because we didn't know which one of these patients had COVID or did not have COVID. So we need to assume that everyone had COVID and uh, take all the uh, personal protective measures. And uh, it was a difficult time because we also had limited resources. Our hostels were full with uh, COVID patients. We didn't have uh, uh, ICU beds available. And uh, some of the traumatic brain injury patients, they also had concomitant uh, COVID infections that uh, made the prognosis even, even worse and made things more difficult for them. So it was a difficult time. Um, thankfully, it's behind us and hopefully we won't leave it again. And uh, I would like to, um, at this point, I would like to uh, mention a few things about uh, consciousness, because uh, in trauma, we, we constantly evaluate uh, the, conscious, the level of consciousness of the patient, and uh, that, that's the most important part, or one of the most uh, more important parts of our exam in these patients. 
So th this is a, a, a big topic for discussion. Just wanted to bring up some points um, uh, for you. So we, basically we don't have a good definition for consciousness. Uh, the best uh, definition that we have is this one that is the state of awareness of the self and one's relationship to the environment. We're basically there replacing consciousness with awareness. And somebody might say, okay, what is awareness then? So basically it's very difficult to define what, what is consciousness. We all know what, what it means to be conscious, but it's a little bit difficult to put it in words and explain it, uh, you know, what, what it means to be conscious. Uh, we think that uh, immensely, we, we like to think that it has two components. One is the level of uh, alertness uh, or arousal, as we call it. And then is the content of uh, consciousness. So for example, somebody that is uh, awake, uh, but is not oriented, has a good level of arousal, but the content of uh, consciousness is, is impaired if the, that person is, is confused. And there's a continuum uh, from coma all the way to being awake and oriented which is the normal state of uh, an awake and alert and conscious uh, person. Uh, sleep is the, oops, sorry about that. Uh, sleep is the only normal state of altered consciousness. Um, all the other states of altered consciousness are usually up, are, are abnormal. For example, there might be effects of uh, medications uh, or it might be coma after uh, a brain injury or might be some other uh, sequel of traumatic brain injury like the vegetative state or the minimal conscious state. But sleep is the only normal state of altered consciousness. And uh, in the past, you know, we used to find, uh, uh, we used to measure consciousness with uh, some uh, terms that, like lethargy, stupor, but these are very subjective. So um, it was a little bit difficult to, um, to have, uh, let's say, interrator agreement, you know, so, so a patient might be lethargic for one, but in stupor for another uh, um, doctor. So the Glasgow Coma Scale that was introduced in the 70s provided us with a quantitative and more precise method to assess the level of consciousness. And this is uh, the main uh, measurement, uh, type of measurement that we use uh, for the level of consciousness in our clinical practice. Uh, and uh, again, consciousness is a, is a very big subject and uh, you know, for somebody to really dive into it means to have uh, knowledge of medicine, philosophy, physics, neuroscience, neuroanatomy, psychology. Um, and there's no, there's no discipline that you know, can combine all these very diverse type of uh, uh, expertise. Uh, so for example, I might you know, um, read like a paper by um, um, a physicist or a philosopher about consciousness and they, they try to explain something, uh, you know, uh, an altered state of uh, consciousness that we see in medicine. And I, I find their description to be either inaccurate or overly simplistic. And I'm pretty sure that when I try to, you know, talk about consciousness with a philosopher and I try to bring it in, 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 into philosophic terms, the philosopher will also find uh, my knowledge uh, in philosophy uh, very, you know, inaccurate or probably overly simplistic. So what, what I want to say is that there is no, again, there is no discipline that can combine all that knowledge that is required in order to really um, study study consciousness. So it's a true multidisciplinary subject, and uh, it's one of the um, one of the fields in uh, I wouldn't say just medicine, I would say in science that uh, it remains uh, you know poorly understood. And I think uh, that um, hopefully you know in the next years as research progresses, we'll, we'll see some progress in that field. So. Uh, uh, a few more things about brain uh, plasticity. So you might see that, uh, you know, in anatomy books that uh, they describe that there's some functions of the brain that are located in specific parts for, of the brain. For example, frontal lobe is where the working memory is, is uh, where the movement is generated. Occipital lobe is where the vision is uh, processed. Temporal lobe has to do with memory and language, uh, parietal lobe with uh, the sensation. But we need to remember that uh, the brain is not just, you know, as as uh, Dr. Sachs uh, sec said here, it's not just autonomous modules put together, but all these modules are very closely integrated. And uh, it's by the total integration of all these modules that we have you know, the, a functional brain. So why, why do I mention that? Uh, I mentioned that because it has to do with brain plasticity. So basically if there is an injury to a part of the brain, then the brain has, um, the ability to kind of rewire itself. And uh, although, you know, part of the brain was permanently injured, but that function that was done by that part of the brain 
can be taken over by a different part of the brain. And uh, the patient can, uh, can restore uh, the lost function by having other parts of the brain taking over uh, that particular function. Uh, again, that's not something that happens fast. It takes time, it requires uh, rehabilitation, but it's important to be familiar with this concept of brain plasticity because it's very, very important when we're dealing with uh, the rehabilitation, the recovery of patients from uh, brain injury in general. So, um, yeah, so um, I don't know if you have any, any questions. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about um, the coordinated trauma care and neurosurgery team you were talking about earlier, about how everyone's kind of working together from interdisciplinary fields. In, uh, in trauma, yes. So in, uh, in a trauma hospital, uh, we have a very close integration between uh, the various services. So uh, a patient comes first uh, in the emergency department and it is the emergency department team the doctors and the nurse of the emergency department that they try to stabilize, as we call the patient, and resuscitate the patient. And then uh, they start uh, the, um, the, the workup to find what kind of injuries that patient uh, suffered. And uh, uh, they might get uh, computer tomography, they might get an ultrasound, and then it's the radiology team that provides us with additional help because they interpret uh, the images from, uh, uh, from, from that patient. And then depending on the types of injuries that these patients suffer, then uh, the trauma team might have to do an operation in the chest or in the abdomen. The neurosurgery team might have to do an operation in the brain or in the spine. The orthopedic uh, surgery team might have to do an operation in, uh, in the arms or in the, in the legs. And uh, all these teams, they, they basically uh, we're working simultaneously. So it's, it's a very closely integrated uh, um, group of different teams that we're working simultaneously to in order to save time and be able to treat these pathologies as fast as possible. Great, thank you so much. I also just put in the chat that I'll be leading the Q&A section. So if people have questions um, that they're uncomfortable asking, you can chat me. Um, and we got one about if you could explain more about the Glasgow uh, Coma Scale in the 1970s. Okay, so um, okay, so um, before the 1970s, uh, uh, we, we used to uh, when we we're dealing with a patient that had a decreased level of consciousness, we used to say, "Oh, the patient is lethargic." or the patient is in stupor or obtanted. So we're using various words that it meant different things for different people. So we didn't really have a, a common language to describe. And I might see a patient and uh, I will consider that patient to be lethargic. And uh, the next doctor that will examine the patient might find that patient to be uh, in stupor. So we didn't know if it was just a different uh, description of the same thing or there was a true change in the patient's status. So, so there was a need for a quantitative way to measure the level of consciousness. So in Glasgow, a team of neurosurgeons back then came up with this uh, uh, classification, uh, with this grading scheme, where basically you assess these three different uh, functions, the eye opening, the verbal response, the motor response, and you give a score from zero to from one to four uh, for eye opening, one to five for verbal response, and one to six for motor response. And you add up these three different uh, scores you come with a score from, uh, that starts from three and goes up to 15. 15 is uh, when we're fully awake, oriented, we're able to follow the commands that somebody else is telling us. And three is uh, the worst possible um, level of consciousness where basically there is no response at all uh, from the patient. You, you even apply painful stimuli and uh, you, the, the patient does not respond because the brain is so uh, injured, so badly injured that that information cannot be processed in order to uh, generate the uh, reflexive uh, movements of, of, of the body. So it, it was a, a big progress and uh, there, there have been some other uh, coma scales that uh, were proposed after, after that, but that remains uh, the main one and the most widely used uh, uh, coma scale. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a general question about how can you decide 
when a surgery is too risky or can be life-saving? Great question. So, yes. Uh, so, uh, it, sometimes uh, it, it's very, very difficult to tell whether there is uh, any chance for meaningful recovery on, on a specific patient. And then uh, in, in these cases, if there is family present, we might uh, get into a discussion with, with the family to try to assess what uh, this patient wishes will be. So if, for example, we know that by doing the, sur uh, the surgery, that the best case scenario is that the patient that will end up in a minimal conscious state uh, requiring a tracheostomy uh, and not being able to talk, not being able to interact with the environment. And uh, if that's something that the patient will never want you know, before, then we might not proceed with surgery. Uh, but in cases of any doubt, we always err on the side of doing the surgery. We want to err on the side of offering the maximum we have. And if uh, the patient does not survive, at least we, we, we tried our best to, you know, uh, to, to save that patient's life. Um, so sometimes, you know, if we think that there is zero chance for meaningful recovery, we see that the whole brain is destroyed. Then we also need to be aware of, uh, you know, preserve resources and we should use resources that can be used better for another patient, because there, there are resources and even, you know, uh, they're not unlimited and we need to be aware of that. But if there is a chance, we we always err on the side of doing the surgery and offering them the maximum we have. Thank you, Shark. If you want to ask your question. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. Margetis, uh, I think it's so fascinating to just like learn about the collaboration of the trauma team and how everyone's like working in that like really acute interval to like, and like just like a very sensitive time to like save the patient. And like, I'm just like curious about something uh, like when you are working with such a time sensitive situation, uh, if you have like multiple, I don't know if this is ever the case, but like if you have another neurosurgeon there and if you're like not the only person and you have a disagreement on whether you should move ahead with certain intervention like how do you resolve that conflict and like do you consult any other physicians in the network like for example at Mount Sinai or like what's like the standard protocol for that? Uh, yeah so uh, for in a trauma center there are always two neurosurgeons uh, on call so uh, we have the main person that is on call and there's always a backup person in case there are two patients that come in and require you know surgery at the same time so there's always um, there are always two neurosurgeons available um, that, that's part of the requirements uh, of a hospital to be a trauma center now in some cases you know things are not very clear and uh, it's, it's, we cannot be sure whether you know we should operate or about the type of operation. And um, you know, I showed you some cases that were really straightforward, but uh, in reality, most of the cases you, you have a, a mix of pathologies, and uh, the type of management or the type of surgery that uh, a patient might need is not is not straightforward. So in these cases, you know, we can always uh, consult another colleague uh, that has experience in this field and. You know, it, it's, it's very common to call. Um, I have done that myself. They have done other colleagues that with me. And, uh, you know, I'll call him and, and I'll call her and tell, tell that other neurosurgeon, look, I have this patient. This is the pathology. This is the CAT scan. I'm between, you know, wh whether I should do this type of surgery or the other type of surgery. What, what do you think? So, yeah, we have the capability. And uh, that's actually, um, it, it's not a sign of, um, how can I say, of weakness or... Uh, uh, you know, to, to, to do that. But on the contrary, it means that you you want to offer, you know, the, the best to that patient. And uh, if there's any doubt, you want to share that with another colleague and get uh, their opinion and try to do the best for, for, for the patient. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. We have a few questions in the chat again. Um, uh, this one's a little bit long. It's, you mentioned the difficulty in evaluating consciousness. How is that evaluated in the emergency room or another medical setting? Furthermore, would this be documented in the medical notes and how would it be documented? Who is qualified to make these evaluations? And you can um, open the chat and see the uh, list of questions if it's easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we use... Uh, um...
Yeah, so we use the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, that, that I mentioned. That's uh, the main uh, instrument that we use to measure the level of consciousness. And this can usually is done by uh, a physician in the emergency department, or it can also be done by a nurse uh, or a physician assistant. So there are many people who are qualified to, to assess that. And uh, this is uh, definitely, it is documented in the medical chart. It's, uh, it's part of uh, actually the, the mandatory uh, pieces of information that we need to document for a trauma patient. We're, we're obligated by the American College of Surgeons to document that and also to keep track uh, of this information. We report all that information to the American College of Surgeons. So uh, yeah, so it is the Glasgow Coma Scale. And uh, in some cases, uh, for, for traumatic brain injury, uh, this can be done by the trauma team, the emergency medicine team, uh, or the neurosurgery team. Actually, what usually happens is whoever evaluates the patient also um, documents uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale because the Glasgow Coma Scale doesn't necessarily remain stable. So when the patient comes in and uh, has lost a lot of blood, then uh, the, the, uh, the emergency medicine team might get a GCS of three, which is the lowest possible score. But after they give that patient uh, fluids and blood and transfuse blood, then the Glasgow Coma Scale can improve. And when, my, when, when the neurosurgery team evaluates a patient five or 10 minutes later, it might have improved to five or six. So it, it is important for whoever evaluates the patient to also evaluate and document separately the Glasgow Coma Scale because it can change over time. And uh, it doesn't mean that one didn't calculate the Glasgow Coma Scale correctly, the other one did. It's just it, that it can fluctuate over time. And uh, for some other pathologies, uh, for example, if it is a stroke that has happened to the patient, then uh, either an emergency department doctor or a neurologist uh, might have to evaluate uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, I see another question about uh, brain plasticity in TBI rehab. Uh, yeah, very good question about uh, neural stem cells. Um, yeah, there is actually ongoing research uh, using neural stem cells. Uh, it hasn't translated into clinical practice, so it's not that we don't have like a, a specific treatment that we can uh, give to uh, our patients nowadays, but there is still uh, significant ongoing research with uh, stem cells. And uh, there are also other types of, um, of therapies like uh, injecting like neurotrophic factors in the brain, or you know, probably in the near future we might have a brain massive interfaces and we might be able to modulate the brain function through electricity. So it is an exciting field. Uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, it's still, let's say at the early, uh, at the early phases. So I, another uh, good question, do you encounter cases where undergoing surgery may improve the patient's life expectancy but decrease quality of life? How do you approach the patient and family under those circumstances? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a very good question. That, that can be a very, very difficult uh, decision that we need to make. For example, there's a patient who comes in with severe traumatic brain injury. And, uh, you know, even if we do everything we can, you know, the best case scenario might be the patient ending up in what we call a minimally conscious state or in a vegetative state, basically. It will give the appearance that, you know, the patient is awake, the patient will hold the eyes open, but the patient will not be able to communicate with the environment. You know, you'll, you'll talk to the patient, but there will be no responses, you'll, you know. And um, um, the, the, there's a, a lot of research about how we can, uh, convert this minimal conscious state into a more alert state and more conscious state. But again, we don't have like a very effective, we don't have very effective treatments for that right now. And uh, in some cases, we need to have, uh, you know, a discussion with the patient uh, family or, you know, pe with people that knew the patient beforehand and uh, ask them, you know, what, what will the patient's wishes be, you know, whether the patient will want something like that for, for you know, for, for themselves to end up in a situation like that. Because if uh, some patients, they, they will say that will never want to be like with a tracheostomy. And if uh, they end up like with a, on a ventilator, they don't want that type of life for them. There are others that they, they say that they have expressed their wishes to their family that they want to stay alive no matter what, no matter what is their condition. So it is an individualized uh, decision. And uh, basically it, it's very, very important 
to speak with the family and try to get a better understanding. And uh, in some cases, you know, it's still very, very difficult. In that case, we need to have like a, a goals of care uh, conference where we, you know, the doctors, we and the family, we meet together and we try to come up with the best decision for, for, for the patient. And again, if there is any question, we always err on the side of offering the maximum we have. It's, it's about these cases that uh, we think that uh, the intervention will not really lead to a meaningful recovery that uh, we need to have these very difficult discussions and uh, make these very, very difficult decisions. And uh, how, uh, how can you check uh, if an old injury has healed properly? Is there any exam to do it? So yeah, that can be, um, that can be difficult to tell whether it has healed properly. Uh, there, there are ways to uh, assess that. Uh, the, the, the best way is uh, the clinical examination to see if there's any kind, if there, if there are any kinds of uh, neurological deficits on, on the patient, if there's any weakness, any decreased coordination. Or in some cases, we might need to do some uh, advanced neuropsychological tests to see if there is any impairment in the cognitive function of the patient that is left from, uh, from the injury. And uh, in some other cases, we, uh, we get MRI and a CAT scan and we see whether there's any residual injury uh, to the brain. But as I said, you know, what we see on the, on the imaging studies doesn't always correlate with the, the patient's clinical status because of the plasticity of the brain. So we might get a CT scan or an MRI and see a node injury uh, on the brain, but that patient might be an absolutely normal person because um, the, the brain uh, due to the, the plasticity has restored all the, the function um, that this injured part of the brain was, was doing. Are there any final questions? If not, thank you so much, Dr. Margitis, for your time and um, giving this amazing presentation. Thank you very much. It was, it was my pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Thank you, Dr. Margaritas. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.